Hi, my name is Alethea and I've been making YouTube videos for six months. I'm going to go through what worked, what did not work, the challenges that I faced, also give some advice to myself six months ago. Let's start with some channel stats. I have 1,225 subscribers. I have published 19 videos. The first one officially was on the 26th of April, 2023. Then in June, I met another YouTube content creator called Leah from Leah's Field Notes. I had the privilege of watching everything that she was doing. I was watching how she was filming and just the whole process behind the scenes. And she really encouraged me to publish a video of my own so that when she posted videos that also had me in them, people would be able to find my channel and learn a little bit more about my life. My first take is a hot take. For me, what worked in the channel was abandoning consistency. I know if you're here, you've probably watched a whole bunch of YouTube videos like me that say that you have to be consistent, you have to post every week, and if it's for the algorithm, blah, 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 blah. I knew straight off the bat that that was not going to work for me. I have uh, a very unpredictable life. It's one thing to say that, oh, if you don't have the discipline and you can't do YouTube or make videos, but I don't think living is linear. I like the idea that being consistent is about you as the creator sticking to a schedule and maybe achieving a certain goal but I knew that if I latched onto the idea of consistency being one of the only markers for success I would not want to do it at all. Another thing I want to say about making a video every week from the start is that it doesn't account for how steep the learning curve is. Writing, scripting, filming, editing and then I also learned how to make like graphics and animations and shit. I don't know how you can learn how to do those things every week. I couldn't manage doing my regular jobs, maintaining my responsibilities, going sailing and all of that in one. It was just too much. For me, it worked to abandon consistency to focus on growth and learning. Number two, on the back of abandoning consistency, I still set goals and I made sure they were small and realistic. In July, once I posted that very first video, I just decided that I would make 10 videos. The number 10 was completely arbitrary. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make 10 videos by the end of the year and I'll just see what happens. And I also want, again, arbitrary. I want to have a thousand subscribers by the end of the year with the idea that in the long run, I would become monetized. Hooray! Yay! I also imposed a time limit for my videos because I thought a three to five minute video would be easier to film and edit and then they naturally got longer and longer as I got better at filming and I felt like I had more of a story to tell. The last thing that really worked for me is building a support group. So I want to challenge the narrative that on YouTube you have to do everything on your own. You have to like have a million amazing ideas and like ideate all of your thumbnails and your titles and your scripts and you just do it all in a cave. What that support group looked like was a few friends who were also doing content creation could help me redefine my thumbnails and my titles or suggest things for me to do or move onward and this sort of support group was a two-way street so sometimes they'll come to me as well and ask me for some ideas and then we will work together to support each other congratulate each other and that has been so so helpful so that I'm not feeling like why am I doing this what didn't work there are a lot of things that didn't work the first thing that i did not do successfully was define my niche so much youtube advice is like almost copied and pasted and the overwhelming advice is that you have to define your niche and then you stick to it there's a lot of that anti-advice now that says no such thing exists as a niche and that you're you're forming a niche of one but not only did I fail at defining my niche I actually masqueraded as another <gasps> niche so let, let me explain what I mean by that so I live on a sailboat and I don't consider myself a boating channel on YouTube there is a category called sailing YouTube and often these channels are prefaced by the word sailing sailing la vagabond sailing zatara 
sailing Uma, channels that are all about cruising, sailing. They're very popular for people that want to have that sense of escapism and also for people that are looking to live that life of their own. Then what I also like is a more lifestyle girly but cinematic. <laughs> so I love channels like Isabel Page, Life of Reza and Cottage Fairy because they are channels that are also about alternative ways of living or looking at life but the visual and cinematographic emphasis is really strong so I want to bring all of that together to show the way that I'm living because I've been marketing myself as a sailing channel like I'll put boat life in my thumbnail and my titles are a bit like more baity toward people that are maybe looking for like a boat life concept I know I've not been reaching the right audience. To me, the target audience of these videos is not defined by age or gender or geographic region. It's about how you approach life and the kind of philosophy you're trying to develop about how you want to live. So if I'm just attracting sailing YouTube people, some of those people are interested in the philosophy of sailing. But if you are like a long-term sailing junkie and you're looking at my video because you want to learn how to clean out your bilge or rewire your 12 volt lighting system, it's not that I'm not going to show those things, but it's not necessarily going to be a how-to channel. I, I love the idea of doing tutorials, but it's still going to be fun and entertaining. I don't want to just put in the minimum effort to film a whole bunch of things and then whack them together. To me, if I can't make something beautiful, then I, I don't really I don't want to do it. My mission is less about teaching you how to hoist the sails and more about getting you to think about the life that you're living and the life that we are all living. We can all have an existential crisis together. And the final thing that I want to talk about that didn't work for me was hiring an editor. I watched Ali Abdal's video about outsourcing editing as soon as possible. And I really like the idea of outsourcing and treating the operation like a business from the start. I also lacked the skills to edit at the beginning of this journey. And I had a friend who was a full-time editor so she's a professional like went to school and everything for video making and I hired her. One of the best things about that experience is that I learned how to express what it was that I wanted in an edit. So I learned how to articulate my ideas to an editor and created a process for revising what she had created, communicating, setting footage. It was awesome to lay out all of that protocol so that in the future, if I'm going to hire another editor or add to the team, I have all of that groundwork already laid out. Now, the reason it didn't work out for me is that I actually ended up loving editing. I love learning, that's my, my superpower. I think if it's really exciting and I'm excited and curious about something, then it becomes my obsession. Like that's the only thing that I can think about. I learned so much from watching my editor edit. Like how she would edit things in certain sequences, how she would cut things, how she used like little zooms and cuts and added like little graphics to make things really interesting. And so I had this opportunity to sort of shadow her as she was helping me edit these videos. So I'm not opposed to getting an editor in the future. I will link the videos that we edited so you can see um, what she helped me create. But I'm excited to see what it is that I can also create to start. All right, so the next thing is to talk about some challenges that I've endured in the last six months. I don't think I realized how long videos take to make. I'm an impatient person. I did not allocate enough time to learn to film, to learn how to edit efficiently, to learn how to be comfortable with the fact that I'm talking right now to a big black bulb. Hello? That challenge was eased by being more forgiving. I can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> I think being understanding that things are taking a little bit longer than you might have thought or budgeted. It's perfectly normal 
I remember a quote from, I think his name is Greg McKeown. Maybe it's Jeff McKeown. One moment, call it. Let me Google it. Greg McEwen. So I remember reading Essentialism and he said that the amount of time that you budget for something to happen, you should double it or triple it even. And he was talking about project management. But I think learning YouTube is project management, learning how to manage yourself. Your department's just you, right? Yes, Jim, but I am not easy to manage. So another challenge, although this was an expected challenge because I have faced this in many different parts of my life, is dealing with imposter syndrome. Every time I get even a hundred views, I just think that's insane. I'm like, whoa, a hundred people want to watch me or listen to what I have to say? Like, I must be a fraud. Like, something must be wrong with him and something must be wrong with me. I'm so critical of myself that it's been hard to celebrate the wins and because the wins at the beginning are so slow and the process is just excruciating it makes it really disheartening and then the last challenge which is something i think everybody who decides to be a creator any form of media in which you express your opinion you are going to be met with haters how does that song go like a haters anthem I love the way it feels to be a hater. I have so much to say about this because this whole video was inspired because I realized having haters means that my content is being pushed out to a greater audience. When people post things that are really like non-constructive, that's nothing on you as a creator. If it's like like I've received some comments that are like, can you please put the subtitles in a different color because I struggle to read it? That's totally constructive. I, I, I get that. You know, I'm an optometrist. I should have thought about that myself and I can do better. But if someone says that I'm a cheap shot and that I'm mediocre and that I should think about what I'm doing because I'm a princess, I'm like, are you okay? <laughs> How can you not feel embarrassed to leave that comment? I just imagine a person like shrouded in darkness wearing a shirt that hasn't been through the laundry in six months and they're like sitting in an armchair that is like tatted and the sponge is like coming out from underneath the upholstery cover they've got crumbs from like stale bread that they were eating and they're like oh, i'm going to make myself feel better by writing this comment i just laugh because I don't really have anything to say to them. It it still it still hurts, you know. I still feel in my in my body that I'm going to fight or flight. I'm wondering what the best etiquette is for dealing with haters or comments which are non-constructive. Do I just leave them? Do I have to think about censorship and freedom of speech? But to me, it's okay expressing an opinion that's different, but if the way that you've expressed it is so psychologically charged and intended to cause harm, I don't know, does your comment really deserve to be there? You can let me know in the comments what I should do with hate. Reflections and advice. Have trust in your own judgment. There's so much advice on YouTube. There's so many videos. There's so many people that claim that they know what's best for success. But nobody knows what's best for success for you as well as you know what's good for you. Even this video and all the things that I'm saying, they're not going to apply to everyone. You get to pick what you think is going to work for you and then you get to apply it. It's like a game. It's like an experiment. So if you are on YouTube and you're just experimenting and playing, it gives you the opportunity to reflect on what it is you like and how you can make this work for you. You don't have to be on YouTube for the money. You can be on YouTube for the vibes. I'm on YouTube for the vibes. Then you have to pace yourself. On the latest video from Teja Hillo, a comment was made about how everyone's trying to speed around YouTube. And I thought that was a really good analogy. People are trying to do things as quickly as possible and like get to the top straight away and instantly become a viral hit. But if you're doing everything so quickly, do you even have time to enjoy the journey? Do you even have time to enjoy what you're actually doing? And do you have the space to grow in ways that are maybe a bit more unexpected? Find things that are unique only to you and that make you fulfilled? 
or are you just following some other formula that is claiming to get you straight to the top? Where would the fun be in that? That would be so boring. I want to create at a pace that allows me to continue to create. I want to create at a pace that allows me to enjoy creating and to maintain this pace so that I can stay curious. I think approaching this like a game or an experiment has stopped me from taking myself too seriously, which has also been a blessing. It just means that if a video does really well, I'm like, whoa, that's very exciting. But if a video flops, I'm just like, oh, well, that was just a flop. And I guess maybe some flops are needed in order to work out what is not a flop. To finish up, I want to talk about what's next for this channel. I would love to become a YouTube partner and become monetized. I am so far doing a okay job. <laughs> I have the subscriber requirement, but not the watch time. And from my trawling through Reddit in the middle of the night, I think that's a quite a common issue. Some people are able to get the watch time, but not the subscribers and others the other way around. I obviously want to reach the right audience and I hope that I've reached creators and people that are looking at living their lives in unconventional ways. And so I also want to connect with more creators so that I can learn from them and be part of a greater community because making YouTube videos is kind of lonely. To finish, I like to draw on this idea that I tell all of my students when we're analyzing a text, whether it's a play or a film or a novel, which is that if the person who created this, this, this book, this YouTube video or this film has created it, that is a lot of effort. If they've gone through that effort, surely they have something to say. And I think that is exactly why I've arrived here. After six months of YouTube, I know I'm here because I have something to say.